This morning's scripture is from Isaiah 2, chapters 1 through 5. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Beautiful and a fitting question to begin our Advent season. For a couple of years in the late 80s, I was the part-time pastor of a disciples church about 30 miles west of Indianapolis in a little town of 600 people. It was corn country and that in the summer you could get completely lost on the identical looking county roads surrounded by corn stalks 10 feet tall. There was a hill a few miles from that little town 
only a couple of hundred feet tall, but it was the highest thing for miles. Perched on it were television and other antennas. What I learned when lost on one of those county roads, having received directions about how to get to a church member's house, like turn left at the corner where Mr. Jones's house used to be before it burned. <laughs> but when I was lost on one of those hazy, hot, cut it with a knife, humidity summer days, if I could spot that hill and its antennas, I could reorient myself. I could know the way I needed to go. Since that time, I've lived in places that have much more dramatic mountains. Mount Diablo in the San Francisco Bay Area that rises up so unexpectedly and gives you something interesting to look at while you're stuck on the freeways. The twin volcanoes of Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea in Hawaii, whose presence always reminded me that I was standing on some of the newest land on Earth. And of course now, Pikes Peak, which immediately tells you east from west and helps you know which way you need to go. What is the purpose of such landmarks, such mountains, such high places? They function in many ways in our lives, don't they? They are markers for our nostalgia. As when you go back somewhere you've been away from for a very long time and the sight of a landmark brings back all kinds of memories. They can also be a reminder of solidity and stability. When our lives don't feel very solid or stable at all. And such landmarks, such mountains, such high places are referred to in the Bible over and over again. At the beginning of 2nd Isaiah, the news that the Hebrew people's exile is about to come to an end comes from a high place. And then there are the powerful and comforting words of Psalm 121, I look to the hills from where my strength comes, my help comes from the Lord. And today's scripture, the first of our Advent scriptures from the prophet Isaiah, tells us that in the days to come, the Lord's house will be established on a mountain and all the peoples of the earth shall look to it, shall come to it. But why? Why are they coming? Why is this scripture traditionally chosen by the lectionary on the first Sunday of Advent? the beginning of the season in which we prepare for the coming of Christ once again. Well, look at what the folks who are coming to that mountain are going to do. They're coming to be taught. They're coming to learn. They're coming to receive God's instructions about what is important and what's true and what really matters. In other words, and as the title of the sermon has it, they're coming in order to learn how to live discerningly rather than superficially or fearfully or mistakenly, discerningly. And all of us need that reminder of what is truly important what is really true, what is life-giving instead of fear-inducing. We need such instruction, such teaching, such discernment in an era in which fake news sites on the internet and on Facebook have proliferated in a frightening fashion and millions of people of every political persuasion have found themselves duped 
by news that was not news at all, but simply bald-faced lies. We need such instruction, such teaching, such discernment in a time when it is more and more likely that you may not know or ever talk to someone who is of a different political persuasion as you. When a huge percentage, a huge percentage of Americans say that they do not personally know someone of another faith, and so they are easily misled by the lies spoken about one another. We need such instruction, such teaching, such discernment in a time when food banks across this country, including here in the Springs, are reporting huge increases in the number of folks who can no longer reliably feed their families, particularly perhaps we need that instruction in an era in which Americans this year will spend an average of $46 per animal on Christmas gifts for their pets. And so then, what wisdom, what discernment, what teaching does the prophet Isaiah have to offer us? If I were to put it into one phrase, it would be this. The coming of Christ, the time of discernment offered to us in our Advent anticipating, is about learning the difference between what we want and what we need the difference between what we want and what God needs. Last week I shared with you a story from the great disciples, preacher and teacher, Fred Craddock. This morning I want to share another one. It goes like this. I had absolutely no interest in buying a car, Dr. Craddock writes, when I drove into the lot where dozens of used cars were on display. Let me explain. Every day between home and work, I passed this car lot where the cars had their prices written in large print on the windshields. From time to time, the cars got moved around, of course, with the exception of one car, always in a favored spot was a real eye-catcher, an old cutlass supreme canary yellow convertible with a black interior. Price, $300. Must be some mistake, some zero omitted, but even at $3,000, it looked like a steal. Now let me stop for a second and say that you can tell this story is from a couple of decades ago. And if he were telling that story today, I suspect he might talk about a Tesla or a Hummer with all the bells and whistles. But listen to how he continues the story. One day it occurred to me, he says, that some buyer would see that mistake in the price and offer the $300 to the horrified owner. So I drove in to warn him of his pricing mistake so he could prevent a loss. But he said, it's not a mistake. $300 is the price. It can't be. What's wrong with it? I kick the tires, check the odometer, search for evidences of being, it's being wrecked or flood, flooded, turned on the ignition and listened as it hummed like a hive of bees. Okay, what's the catch? Well, the car lot owner said, the car does have one unusual feature. It will not take you where you want to go but only where you ought to go. Really? Yes. How many owners has it had? One. Do you have his phone number? Yes. So I called and verified this strange truth. What's it like to have a car like that, I asked. Well, it was absolutely horrible. 
said the former, former owner. I mean, one Saturday I missed my tea time because the car drove me instead to a nursing home to visit the residents. And one evening I missed dinner with friends at a fancy new restaurant because the car drove me to the mall and had me ring bells for the Salvation Army. And then I recall a Sunday morning when my wife was away and I drove to the 7-Eleven or thought I was going to drive to the 7-Eleven to get a paper and a six-pack of beer, but that car took me to church. <laughs> I noticed, Dr. Craddock concludes, that the car is still on the lot and the price has been marked down to $30. Christmas affirms and reaffirms what God has already done for us and this world. And Advent reminds us that God created us to continue to help create with God. For this world is not yet finished, we are not yet finished, and there is much work to be done in this beautiful, bountiful, but too often broken world. For here's the thing, Advent invites us to find our own Olds Cutlass Supreme and take it for a spin because God needs you. God needs all of us. God needs us to help make ever more real that Advent vision that the prophet wrote about and to live discerningly rather than cynically or despairingly or jadedly makes it that much more possible, that much more likely for the prophet's words to become that much more true. Did you hear it? It was a vision, a vision of wholeness and healing, a vision of swords into plowshares, of an end to bullying and violence, an end to homelessness and hunger, an end to children dying because adults lack courage, an end to lies that are lived in too much desperation, and an end to poverty and racism and xenophobia and hatreds based on class or nationality or orientation or gender. For you see, in the words of my wife, Barbara, quote, living in anticipation and hope for such wholeness brings us closer to it because, she says, our hearts take the shape of whatever it is we are anticipating. If we've decided the world is going to hell in a handbasket, our hearts will be shaped that way. But if we've decided that there is at the base of things a God who is working to redeem the world from suffering and we anticipate a day when that work might be complete, well, that anticipation will also shape our hearts. What are you anticipating this day, this season, as we step into the blessings of Advent on the way to the Christmas cradle, I would invite you then, again, to find your own old cutlass supreme and point it toward that mountain of the Lord. Let it point you toward that mountain and pray to God that you will be taken in the direction that you need to go and that you may truly hear and believe God's promise that things will be made new and whole and healed. For on this day of new beginnings, Advent greets us with a promise, a promise that once again Barbara puts so beautifully. Hear her words a second time. Quote, the promise is that God is working to overcome all evil 
and every form of deathliness. And God invites us to be a part of that struggle. God invites us to feed the hungry and house the homeless and visit the lonely and grieving and to wait for and long for and pray for the completion of these promises. For that completion will come. Isaiah proclaims it, Jesus embodies it, God assures it. But God needs our help. And so on this first Sunday of Advent, in Lee, indeed let us pray that God will help us live discerningly, showing us the direction we need to go and joyfully pointing us that way. Amen.